Well, my name is Moses Robbins, and I'm the pastor here at Revolution Church, and I'm joined by two friends today. I'll introduce them to you in just a moment. Um, several months ago, we decided to start a group uh, where pastors from the local community here could gather and pray together and uh, pray for each other's congregations, learn from one another, uh, plan how we could bless our community in a greater way, just together as one body of Christ. You know, we, the, the scriptures talk about that a lot, about unity and harmony, and uh, we want to just come together, and uh, even though over the weeks that you uh, check out these, these videos, you're going to see us disagree on some things, we all agree on one thing, and that's Jesus is Lord. And Amen. so... Uh, we want to just come together and talk about things that we know that you have questions about, uh, social issues that the Bible speaks to, things that go on in the church. Just so, uh, you know, put a bunch of preachers together and find something to talk about. So, um, but we're going to do that. And um, it's just part of this group called Harmony. We would covet your prayers. Uh, we meet once a month, the first Monday of every month here at Revolution. And uh, we just, we, like I said, we pray, we, we share things, um, help each other out and see how we can bless the community together as one body of Christ. Um, so we would ask that you would pray for us. And um, over the next, I don't know how many weeks, months, years, uh, we're going to meet here at the church every Wednesday, and we're going to have these talks. And we're going to put them out on all of our contact points, our digital con contact points, our, our YouTube channels, our websites, our social media, our phone apps, whatever all the churches in our group have, we're going to send these out so you can all uh, take a, a look at these and participate in these talks. So, Anyway, with that being said, I'll introduce you to John Abner. This is John, and uh, you're from Victory Christian Center. Yes, sir. Thank and uh, tell us just real briefly about your church, a little bit about you, and then we'll move on to Tom. Okay. I uh, just recently became senior pastor at Victory Christian Center. I... Uh, served there as youth pastor for 10 years and uh, non-denominational church in Donna Vista. Which is? In between Umatilla and Houston. Yeah, going yeah. down 19. You blink and you miss it. Yeah. But, uh, we were there, a little white uh, school building right there mm -hmm. in town and uh, just honored to be here with you gentlemen today. Thanks for being here. And Tom Baker, Seventh-day Adventist Church in Mount Dora. We let people from Mount Dora into our group. Yeah, Only I'm, cool people. I'm so. the foreigner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, said Tom Baker, Mount Dora Seventh Day Adventist Church, home of uh, Gateway Christian School, uh, pre K to eighth grade. Shameless plug there. But, there you go. Uh, it's all good, man. Um, coming up in a couple of weeks will be our four year anniversary here in this community. Awesome. And uh, just love serving Mount Dora. I, I drove through Mount Dora about, it's going to be about 15 years ago. And I said, man, it'd be so cool to pastor in this area. Uh, and then realizing that... Careful what that, you wish for, dream. huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's cool. Awesome. So the Seventh-day Adventist church that you pastor is right on my door, right on 441. Um, yeah, I always tell people right across from the, the Dodge Jeep Chrysler yep. dealership. And they know where that's at. So. Oh, yeah. Big flashy building. So you see that on one side, look on the other side, and you see the church right yeah. there. It's been a staple here in the community, though, for a long, long time. It's here. So... Glad you guys are here. Well, um, like I said, we're going we're gonna to talk every Wednesday. Um, who knows out of the group who will be here, but uh, this week it's us. And uh, I guess the first topic we were going to talk about, and this was John's thought, and uh, it's a great place to start off. It's, it's, the, it's like, at the, you know, we preach every week about these different topics, and I think a lot of the things that we talk about, we assume, and I know I'm guilty of it, we assume that when we say these kind of church words, people know what in the world we're talking about, you know, um, sanctification and justification and all, you know, all these words and, and I, and I'm guilty. I say it and I'm assuming that they know half of them probably have no idea what I'm talking about. And so this one today we'll start and it's salvation and, uh, it's at the centerpiece of our faith, obviously, you know, it's why Jesus goes to the cross, all that it's salvation. So a great place to start our talks out right there jump off from there and uh what let me let me ask you this john why what led what, what why why salvation why do we talk why why would we talk about salvation first what is it about it that you uh for me personally i accepted christ as my savior when i was 22 years old and so 14 years ago and so it's it's something that is still 
uh, fresh in my, my heart, something that, that I, I refuse to forget, the ditch that Jesus pulled me out of. And uh, it took me, though, where I understood that he loved me, Father, and he gave his son for me. Uh, it took me many years after that, that moment in that Methodist church in Kentucky uh, to really be able to put an answer as to what it meant, what happened. And uh, our expectations are for our congregations to be leading people to the Lord, um, but what are they leading them to? And uh, I'm afraid that if we ask most of them how you will accomplish that, um, they may feel inequipped, and that's our fault. Uh, they don't know because we don't tell them. Right. And so um, the most important thing in all of our lives, above being married, having children, is our relationship with mm -hmm. Father through Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so if we understand what that means, I think that it can be the catalyst mm -hmm. that drives us to, to have a ministry of reconciliation in our community. Yeah. It's, it's funny, you, you, like what, you throw that word around about being saved. And, and I, I, I would venture to say that if you ask the congregation, what does that mean? Like to be saved, to be born again, to be re reborn, to be regenerated, to be, you know, what, what like, what, e what even is that? You know what I mean? Like, what, what is, what does it mean to be saved? Saved from what? Right. Go get saved. Get him saved. From what? So, maybe you could speak to that. Like, what, it, what do you say, what does it mean to even be saved or saved from what? Yeah, what's it mean to the three of us? Well, I... A little bit different um, from you, John. I, I grew up in the church. Um, I was baptized at nine years of age. And I remember that, that day, um, sitting in the foyer, they had all, everybody who got baptized, although I was the only one that day, but you know, you meet, greet the people coming out of church that day. And I remember the old ladies hugging and kissing and saying, so proud of you, Tommy. And I remember, one thing about that, and nine's a pretty young age, but I remember having peace. Mm -hmm. It was just a peace. For me, salvation was being at peace with God. And uh, I did not understand the theological aspects mm -hmm. of salvation. Right. But I experienced it still the same. Right. And I've grown over the years in, in understanding more and more the depths of what it means. And, you know, I guess we're going to be getting into that. But for me personally, it was uh, establishing peace with God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was kind of like that. Um, I shared with our congregation a couple weeks ago that, you know, I grew up in a Jewish home. So I, I definitely knew that and believed that there was a God, like some Thing, dude up there doing something, spinning worlds on his fingers and stuff, but I had no clue about him. But over a certain amount of time, I had questions about him, that I, and I still don't even have answers to him, but at that time, I had tons of questions and not a lot of answers, but I knew there was just something in it knew that like, I totally needed this. And so like even in my, all my doubt, I mean, totally immersed in doubt, he saved me. And I, and I still, and a lot of people feel like they have to have all these answers first. And then, okay, then I'll let him save me. And I, I experienced the complete opposite. I had no answers. Yeah. And in all of my mess, he just reached down and just said, I got you, brother, and save me. And then I started to learn about him, you know, and I think a lot of people feel like, well, I need to, it's in our world too. You, you, you have to, you know, if, if you're going to be a, a professional golfer, you start off by taking some lessons, you know, and, and then you, you work on some drills and you practice and you learn and then hopefully you graduate and get your PGA Tour card and you get to play. Whereas in the kingdom of God, it's totally different. Like. He saves you, and then you start learning. You don't, not every Christian has to go to seminary first, <laughs> yeah. learn all about him, and then go, okay, now I have the head knowledge, I'm in. Which is important because our salvation is not based 
on what we bring to the table. Exactly. And it's based 100% on what he's done on our behalf. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not a preparation that needs to take place. It's simply uh, a believing of what he has done. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think that, that I, I was guilty of uh, in my my in my salvation and early on in my ministry of uh, making heaven more important than Jesus like you need him to get this like eternity and like that was the goal that was the prize at which oh by the way he's the way to do that but I believe that that uh, I've come to a different uh, outlook on that in that um, heaven is not heaven without father we don't want heaven without father and so Really, what happened when I accepted Christ as my Savior was I was separated from Father, and now I have access to Him. Things were made right to bring that peace that, that you're speaking of. And so, um, for me, it was there was a separation from a God in heaven that loved me, and Christ was the price, He paid the price that I could now have access to Him once again. Gotcha. So, what are we saved from? What are we saved from? I mean, saved. I'm saved. From what? I think from self-sufficient isolation from God and from each other. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the rebellion in heaven was a separating of oneself from God and to a new kingdom ideal uh, that separated itself from other center to my self-center, what I want, what I want to get. And unfortunately, I think, uh, not I think, I know in my life, when I become centered on my salvation, I lose the joy of it. When I am so focused on, you know, oh, I don't feel saved, I don't feel saved, right. you know, and then you begin to doubt the, the, the grace of God and the salvation, the power of salvation. And for me, that was, for a long time, a real roller coaster ride, where I believe that okay, I was saved, but now I have to live a good life. And if I don't live that good life, if I, I don't walk the line, I might actually lose my salvation. That has been a, a huge roller coaster until uh, finally I began to understand it actually isn't my salvation, it's his salvation. Mm -hmm. In fact, Revelation 7. You didn't hang up on that cross? What's that? You weren't hanging on the cross? Well, in Christ I was. <laughs> in Christ, right. Yeah. Right. But, you know, Revelation 7, the angels are saving, saying salvation belongs to my God, or belongs to God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. It's their salvation yeah. that they've given to us, that God right. and the Son have given to us. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I have created. That's right. You know, it's something that I receive. From him. It was Paul in Galatians that said, what's wrong with you? You started off in the spirit, yes. and now you're trying to earn your way by keeping these rules, keeping these rules. Through. So it's, that's our default, isn't it? It's a shift. We we'll go, oh, thank you. Now I got this. Yeah. You know, and, and then I have to run with it and try to maintain it and behavior modification. I got to, okay, he, he saved me, but now I got to make sure I quit cussing and I got to quit drinking or else I'm gonna, he's going to be mad at me again. And it, you know, and it is, it's a, it's torture, it's torture. And I think if we, if that's all, that's all we've done is taken our eyes off of Jesus and put them right back on ourself again. Well, and we're guilty of it even from the pulpit of saying, uh, trust Jesus, trust Jesus, trust Jesus. And as soon as they do, we say, okay, now you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this. Exactly. We, we immediately shift it like at that moment of, okay, so here's what happens. Um, I, I often think of Paul on the way to Damascus, um, he's blind, and uh, it says that it was something as scales fell from his eyes, right. and, and he could now see. And so salvation, in a sense, is seeing the need of a savior. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and we're even dependent upon God to open our hearts to even see that we need. Right. And so in the midst of all of this, we're utterly dependent upon Father. That's what he did with Lydia, mm -hmm. uh, her conversion. He, he opened her heart. Ezekiel mm -hmm. talks about replacing a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. But um, we see the need of a Savior, and, and then immediately at the point of seeing the need of a Savior, 
we shift that and say, okay, now you accomplish all of these things, and it does, it gets exhausting. Mm -hmm. Until we get to the point where we realize we can't do it anymore, and we either give up or we come back to the foot of the cross. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why that scripture in Colossians 1 is so important, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because what happens is, is that we're no longer self-centered, but now we're Christ-centered. And he begins to change us from the inside out. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the point of, of impact of, of, of that salvation moment is simply just saying, I, I can't do this on my own. Yeah. I need yes. help. I hate to, to go to the, to the Webster's. You know, we're talking about scripture, we're talking about God, but I, I, I did jot this down. There's two parts to the definition of the word salvation, if you just look them up in a dictionary. Now the second one is exactly what you're saying, it's liberation from ignorance or illusion. That we walk around thinking, we don't need him. Like, I got this, I'm good. And you hear it all the time, uh, are you gonna go to heaven? Well, I think so, because I'm, you know, I'm a good person. And we have this thing that it's all based on me. If I'm good, if I open up open up doors for enough old ladies and I give to charity enough and I'm going to be good with this God. And so part of salvation, not only the ability to actually have a relationship with God because of what he did, he did something, but also it opens up our eyes to this, this false illusion that somehow we're good. I, I don't need him to help me. And that's part of the definition of salvation, that there's this ignorance in us all that thinks I got this. I think one of the hard things for us as, as humans is um, we don't do good works to be saved but we are saved to do good works yeah. and that dichotomy can we can again move it to self look at the good works that I'm doing yeah. rather than I'm doing these things because of the good God has done for me, mm -hmm. what he has done in my life, how he has brought me into right relationship to him. And so out of this joy and peace, I want to share that with others. So I want them to experience the best of life now. And, and I think part of the problem of, of this whole idea of salvation is Christianity has sold salvation as a get out of hell free card, mm -hmm. rather than salvation is right here and right now in my relationship to Father. Yeah. Um, I can experience heaven now with God. I don't have to wait. Right. You know, this is something. And therefore, I need to be active in creating the atmosphere of heaven around me. Where when people come in, they're like, wow, this is, this is a peaceful place to be around. Mm -hmm. I mean, the... <laughs> The people who were anxious around Jesus were the religious types. That's right. And unfortunately, I think in a lot of circles, Christianity has created that uncomfortableness with society around it to where they are not comfortable coming into our presence because they're like, I don't match up to you guys. And we've got to come to grips with that, I think, if we're going to be able to reach the community to, to the people who have not heard the message, have not experienced it, do not think they need to be saved. Right. You know, because to a lot of people that could even be derogatory. Right. You know. Yeah, we don't uh, want to do what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally get it. Well, and when, when Jesus looked out upon the crowds in Matthew 9, um, it says in there that he had compassion for them yes. because, because they were separated from yes. the Father. He said they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so, it, it, was, it wasn't a sense of them against him, even though they were getting ready to kill him, but he instead had compassion for them. Mm -hmm. and, and for us that, that have experienced that peace and, and now having access to Father, uh, you know, first of all, I know that he's worthy of everyone's praise, so I want for everyone to worship him because he's worthy. But secondly, we understand um, the separation that exists that we were born into because of our great, 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 great grandparents, Adam and Eve, and the separation that they caused. And, and, and God has made a way through Christ Jesus to reconcile us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one of the things that I, I jotted down in my notes about, uh, you had mentioned about experiencing salvation. Yeah. I don't know if you meant how to begin that experience. Like, I, I know you had mentioned about our congregation, they wouldn't really know 
how to lead someone there. So maybe that's what you're talking about, about experience, like starting off the experience versus the other type of experience, which is living in it, you know, um, kind of like, uh, I think it's in Colossians too, it says, so now as you came to Christ, so walk in him. Like there's that experience day to day yeah. of living in that relationship with God through Christ. Like, so I don't know about that. I, I don't know which one you were talking about experience. Both, both, they're both, both pretty good. Yeah. Um, well, why don't we do this? Let's let's go down that. Let's start that experience, and then we'll talk about walking in it. Okay. So if if I was, you know, brand new, I just I just got saved. I just came to the altar. I said, "Yes, Jesus, I'm in." Now I need. Of course, the pastor's going to say, hey, now, go share your faith with everybody, you know, you know, great. Start yeah. reading your Bible, start praying. How? Okay. Be nice. Right. Yeah. So teach me, man. What, what do I get? How does, how do I go to my workplace? Because we all say, go to your workplace, go to your family, go to your neighbors, share the gospel. What, what, what in the world would I tell some, some person that is, you know, they're, they're on drugs, their family's a wreck. You know, what, what, I'm, a, I'm a train wreck. Please help me, Tom. Help me. What well, do I do? Let's go. Let's just go one step before that, if we could, before you even get to that place where you say yes. Um, of course, we know uh, the scripture, uh, John 14, says, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father." Again, you know, reconciling us to the Father except through me. Um, John 3:36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Um, but I think that the most important question in the Bible, and, and the question that, that those that are, are viewing this today, um, I hope that they could answer, um, would be uh, upon the death of Lazarus. Jesus comes on the scene. Martha and Mary are there, and uh, he's comforting them in John 11, verse 25 and 26. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yeah. And so the way that we answer that question signals if we've found that we need a savior. Do you believe this? Yes. And I've come to grips that it, it doesn't take us in order for them to believe that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take an altar call for them to believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, it just takes them saying, I need Jesus. Yeah. I'm glad you backed it up to there because uh, I think the I think a lot of times the way that we try to bring people to salvation mm -hmm. is forceful. Mm. You know, um, my my wife and I, with our firstborn, we had a nurse midwife. We were going to have the child born in the house. We bought a hot tub. It was going to be a water birth, and you know, we had it all planned out. How'd that okay. work out for you? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, we went to see uh, nurse midwife, and we heard her say, uh-oh, this is uh, after the due date. And you don't ever like them to say, uh-oh, <laughs> when she's palpitated and she says, I don't think I'm feeling uh, a, a butt down here. And she says, we're going to have to do an ultrasound because I think the baby's breech. Mm-hmm. And so we went, they did the ultrasound. Um, our, our son Chandler, he was breech. He was Frank breech, uh, his feet. Uh, I, I said, but I, had, I don't feel a head down here. His, his um, butt was engaged. And they said, there's not enough amniotic fluid to try and get him turned around. Mm -hmm. You now have to have a C-section. Okay, so we had gone through reading books, planning and preparing for this natural childbirth and all of a sudden we're in this other world. The opposite happens a lot of time too. Natural childbirth is the way God, you know, it was as natural, yeah. it's the way God intended it. That was not correct. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what we do is we'll say, well, we think that baby should be born now, so we'll put an IV in the, mm -hmm. the woman, we'll give her medicine so that she'll start having Induce, contractions. Yeah. yeah, inducing labor. And most people will tell you induced labor is much more difficult than natural labor. Mm -hmm. And then if the baby doesn't come, then you have to go to C-section because we're trying to force this birth. 
And I think Christianity sometimes tries to force the new birth, which we can't do. No. You know? Because if we do, it wouldn't even really be a conversion. Exactly. Nothing's really, no and, heart's been regenerated there. And so when, when we have somebody who experiences that new birth, and we, we tell them, now go out and, and share the gospel. Well, number one, they're a newborn baby, you know. And you don't tell a newborn baby, okay, feed yourself, you know, clothe yourself, change yourself. They, they need to be nurtured and grown. But at the same time, they are on fire. They do have that zeal. They do have people that they're close to that, that they can share. And I think the key is don't give them the Romans road or... or um, if you don't know what Romans Road is, look yeah. it up. <laughs> this is another church thing, sorry. Uh, just people are going to be able to see a difference and just say, I can't explain it. Don't give them, you know, five verses to quote as to why their experience. Just let them share their experience, you know. I, I'm, I'm free, you know. I'm at peace. I, have, I, have, I feel at rest with God finally. And just let them share that. They don't have to know every reason why. I mean, I love what you said about Mary and Martha, yet Jesus gives it to them. They still didn't get it yeah. until yeah. after the resurrection, right. you know. Um, so I, that experience, first of all, is not something that the church does or that the pastor does. Uh, it's something that God does. And then I think we need to teach that to them. You know, because they are on fire. They want to go. They want to convert their neighbors and their families. You got to tell them, "Hey, God did this in you. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, did this, yeah. and you're not either of them." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our buddy uh, Theo, he came and he and he preached here at our church a couple months ago, and he said, "He goes, I know there's a God, but I ain't him. Yeah. That 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 I know." And confidence, know. confidence in Him. Uh, Hebrews 10:35 cast on away your confidence, because then it is great reward. You know, knowing that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, you know, that he's already at the place where eyes have been opened and people have been saved and revival has come and he's already there. And so he's not freaking out in the moment. You know, we're trying to, you know, lead people to the Lord. And uh, I, the greatest thing that we can do is, is, is rely on him and reveal to them through our lives and through our marriages and through our parenting and, and through, you know, the way that we trust him in all circumstances. And, and the reality is, is in the midst of adversity and, and trial, the way that we go through trial and say, I still believe Jesus. I still trust yeah, they, in him. Yeah. That they go, what's wrong with this guy? Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. speaks greater than That happened to me when I got else. led to Christ. It was, and I didn't know the guy was a pastor, so I think God had the deck stacked on me. But I, 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 I met this guy who's at the dealership, at that dealership across from your church, and he's walking around in the, in the, um, in the service area, the lounge, and he's wearing basically what you had on, just a t-shirt and shorts. And he's casual, and he's walking around whistling. I come to find out his transmission in his van was completely blown. Like, the, the case actually blew out the side, mm. and all the guts were just <laughs> destroyed. That's like a $2,500 problem. And it was an old junky van that he wasn't driving because he wanted to. He was driving because he had to. He didn't have any money. And he was whistling, and I'm like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? You know, yeah. And he shares the gospel with me, and I... So I saw something in him that, and I wasn't even, it wasn't even my van and I was stressing out. You know what I mean? Like I, I how does this, I would be free, I mean, who wouldn't be, right? Like freaking yeah. out over, and he was totally calm. Mm. He was at peace, mm. like you said, and that was so attractive. Like I needed to know why. So we ended up having this long conversation. He's like, what do you think about Jesus? He tells me about Jesus. Don't just call him a moral teacher. He claims to be God. You've got to make a choice. You can't leave him on the shelf. And I'm like, wow, you know, but I saw what he had. And I was like, I was intrigued, man. Yeah. Now, being a pastor, he's a Christian guy, you know, he knew scripture. So it was his story, but it was also the word of God that was peppered in. And it is you the know, word of God that transforms lives. It does. I mean, it, the scripture says that, you know, faith comes from hearing the word of God. So our story is crucial. The Bible does say we overcome Satan and all of his junk by what Jesus did on the cross yeah. and our testimony. So we share what God did, but you know, that interwoven with the word of God and it just goes out and and then you just go, not not that I don't care, but it's like, okay, Holy Spirit, now it's on you. So, 
They've seen a difference. God's opened their heart. They've said, yes, we believe. Um, I was for many years that guy that then had the checklist. Okay, you've accepted Christ as Savior, fantastic. Um, you get baptized, and, and that's, that's a whole other conversation. And um, then you need to, you need to start talking to God. You have this relationship with Him, now we call that prayer. And, and you need to learn about Him, and so you need to read the Scripture. And, and yeah, you know, you probably ought to quit smoking, drinking, cussing, running with people that do. And uh, be nice and, and bring, some, bring some people to church and, and give. Yes, you need to definitely. Because Jesus to, never interacted with people who, who <laughs> smoke, ex drink, or Exactly. Right. <laughs> and so, but I was that guy. I had that checklist. Like, yes, Jesus did this. Now you do this. Yeah. And I quit. I don't do that anymore. Um, I take them to Colossians 1. And it's the mystery is what Paul says in verse 26. He said, 26, he says, there is a mystery that has been hidden for ages of generations and it's now revealed to his saints. And then in verse 27 he says what it is. God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Okay, what's the mystery, Paul? The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so going all the way back to where you started, uh, I lived 22 years self-centered. Everything that I did be it drugs, alcohol, taking something that didn't belong to me, whatever it might be, it was to please me. It's what I wanted to do because I was self-centered. But when I accepted Christ as my Savior, when my eyes were open to the need of a Savior, He came and dwelt inside me. And now all of a sudden, I didn't know it at the time, but the transformation was I started doing things that didn't please me, but that instead pleased Him. Yeah. And so my um, suggestion to someone that says, yes, I believe, is don't do anything. Enjoy what's just happened and remind yourself that Christ lives in you. And then we have some responsibility then at that point, um, and not pastors, but believers as a whole, to come alongside that person, teach them how to pray, Teach them how to study the word. And, and here's the good news. I can't teach somebody how to pray if I don't pray. Yeah. And I can't teach somebody how to study the word if I don't study the word. Right. Because I think you guys would agree that um, I could preach 100 sermons on how to study the word. It's not as effective as bringing somebody into my home and saying, come on, let's study the word together. Yeah. And so uh, I don't think that it's the, the, the person that's just said yes is responsibility. I think it's the believer's responsibility, the church's responsibility at that point to come alongside that person. Right. I think that all that person that just said yes needs to do is know that they have access to the Father. Mm -hmm. Something's changed and Jesus dwells inside of them. Yeah. And Jesus does tell us this in his commission, go make disciples and then teach them all I taught you. That's our responsibility as those that are already there to go grab this guy, this gal and, and help them yes. and teach them. So you're absolutely right. Um, Anything else on that point that you want to bring up at all? Because I want to get to one other thing. No, go ahead. I'm ready to move on. <clears throat> I think, uh, just in my experience, that being saved, salvation, you hit on it, get out of hell card kind of a thing. People think, when they, when they think of the word saved, you could almost see the equal sign that talks about heaven. Yeah. And, and what, I, what I don't think most people understand is that saved doesn't start when you go to heaven. Saved starts, it, it's, it's the present reality and the future hope, yes. that there's both. And I don't think that's talked about. I think when we talk about the here and now, we talk about behavior modification in response to the gospel, but we don't talk about the fact that you are saved right now, like there's a bit of heaven, I think you said it, heaven on earth right here, Absolutely. right now. So I've got some verses um, that I wanted to kind of share with you and then we could speak about these things. And uh, so we see in the scripture, it's not just heaven someday. The present reality is like, like here, Psalm 51, 12. It, uh, it says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. 
like restore to, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Like, and that's, he's asking for something right now. He wants to enjoy that experience right now. It's not like, I, I mean, if we're saved, like we're going to be in heaven someday, that's going to be good, right? Mm. But what this guy is saying in, this, in Psalm 51 is, is I want to experience that right here and now. Why is he saying that? I don't know. Psalm 51? 51, 12, I believe it is. Restored yeah. to me the joy of my salvation. Like, like something's going on. He's not, exp he's not feeling it, I guess, mm -hmm. right? And he wants to, but I, but what I'm saying is that he just, the point I, I'm trying to, to make is that there's a present thing right yeah. now. He wants to experience it here and now, not just, you know, this, let me put in my 80 years of a horrible life. It's going to suck. I got to yeah. go through it. And then one day it's going to be good. And this guy's going, no, 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 I want right here, right now. Right? Well, the interesting thing is this is David after he's committed adultery mm -hmm. with Bathsheba and Nathan's called him on the carpet, mm -hmm. you know. Up until um, he's called on the carpet by the prophet, he's still trucking along thinking everything's good. Mm -hmm. And then Nathan says, no, everything's not good. Mm -hmm. you know? And now his response is this, you know, have mercy on me, O God, you know, according to your steadfast love. You know, I, he realizes that he is not experiencing the joy. This is somebody who saved but he is not living in a relationship where he experiences the joy of that salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, um, uh, let me just speak for myself. You know, I, I believe, there was a time where I believed that every time I sinned, I lost my salvation unless I asked forgiveness for it. That's dangerous. Yeah, and until I began to understand, you know, I was saved on the cross. I'd lose my salvation 20, 30 times a day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> salvation is, is given to us in, in uh, past, present, and future tense. Yeah. We were saved on the cross. Mm -hmm. We are being saved right now. New Testament speaks of it as an ongoing process. And we will be saved yes. in the future. Mm -hmm. okay? the, God saving us, he has no more to do with that. That's done. It happened on the cross. Okay. When, when I say yes to that salvation, I experience that. And I, 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 man, I just resonate with what you said, do nothing, it, it, enjoy it. Because if we have to start doing stuff, we're gonna lose it really quick. Yes. Yeah, you know, that experience really quick. Um, especially if you put them to work in the church. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, uh, but the, the present tense of salvation is something that I think that a lot of Christians struggle with. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I was saved, but life is now hitting me. Yeah. And all these things are happening. I have a boss who's a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have, um, I have a spouse who isn't easy to live with, or I have a spouse who's left me, or, you know, I've had a kid who's been diagnosed with cancer or, you know, recently out in our neighborhood, we had two teenagers who were killed in a car accident. You know, at that time, it's difficult to experience the joy of salvation. Yeah. You know, you don't go up to somebody who's experienced that and say, well, just trust in the Lord and everything yeah. will be yeah, okay. No one wants to hear a Bible verse <laughs> when the world's crushed. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we have a tendency of, of wanting people to suppress their emotions. Those emotions are real, and they're there for a reason. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think I think of it going back to your illustration with Mary and Martha. Jesus says all this. He mm -hmm. says to Martha first when he meets her, "Do you believe he will live again?" Yes, I do believe. You know, in the resurrection. Yeah. And I am the resurrection of life. Go get your sister, and he comes out. And when Mary shows up in the mourners, it says, Jesus wept. Yes. Yes. He didn't say, cheer up, it's going to be fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and, he, God has everything yes. for a and he knows in just emotion. a couple of seconds, he's going to raise him from yes. the dead. Yes, that's good. And yet he is bawling. Yeah. I mean, I'll, you've probably seen Jewish people, you know, well. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> but, well. Uh, they were professionals back yes, then. Yes, exactly. And, to be a professional criers at funerals but was great. If Jesus, and, and the fact that that is recorded, that could have been bypassed without 
you, you know, those two little words could have been left out yeah. of that account of the gospel. Yeah. But they were included in there for a reason. Not yeah. viewed as weakness. Yes, not at all. exactly. Well, there is a present reality that people don't get it. And it's not that everything's peaches and cream, but there is a joy. There's a, there's a present aspect to, the, to, to your salvation. You know, Jesus, one of, one of my favorite verses, it's probably your favorite, one of your favorite verses too. It seems to be a popular one. John 10, 10. I came that you might have life abundantly. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not like, I, it's not, it doesn't say, I came that you might have a crappy 60 <laughs> to 80, and then it's going to be good. Like we all read towards the back of the book where it talks about where we're going to be in heaven, and everything's going to be great, no more pe tears and pain and suffering. I get it. So Kevin's going to be good. Like yeah. no one, because, because it's all good. Oh, He's there. God's right there. Yeah. It's all good, right? Yeah. And it's going to be perfect delight 24 7, 365, forever. But we're here now, and it's not that salvation is going to be there where we're up on clouds with harps. Yeah. It's not that. It's right here, right now. Jesus said, I can't even have abundant life. Like, right now, there's a present reality to our salvation. Second Corinthians 6, 2. Today is the day of salvation. And, it's, and people use that as like, like, today's the day you should get saved. Like, I get that, but how about today is the day of salvation? Today and then tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is the day of salvation, and the next day, and the next day, and then every day is the day of salvation. Because that text never changes. You read it today; it's the same as it was yesterday. It's the same as it'll be tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. Let's is, experience it now. I'm not living 60. I'm going for a healthy hundred. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to live 60 to 80. Gotcha. But um, I, I've never saw this. I've never taught it. But when you said something, it. it it spurred something in my spirit that um, when we die or when Christ returns, when we are spiritually alive because we've accepted him as Savior, there, at that point, it is as though there is a, a consummation of our salvation, that it's, it's finalized. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph was betrothed to Mary. There was no consummation of the marriage but there was a promise that they were going to get married. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says in Matthew uh, 1, when he found out that she was pregnant, he was going to divorce her. Yeah, how do you divorce someone who's never Even been married? Even though they weren't right. married, right. it wasn't consummated. Married. And so there was a betrothal. So back then, a betrothal was as good as marriage. It was the same thing, except it hadn't been consummated. It's almost so, like a house. You move in, it's your house. It is your house. But 30 years from now, it's your house and it's a completed thing. Like it's been your house for 30 years, yeah. but now it is. I got the deed, bro, it's mine. Yeah. It's always been mine, That's but right. now it's really mine. It's fullness of the salvation. And the mm -hmm. thing I'd like to, to share when I'm studying this with others is that um, this issue about being betrothed and married and so forth, God says, I will never divorce you. Yeah. I will never leave you and forsake right. you. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. You, I've signed on the dotted line. The promise is not based on faulty promises. This is a promise from somebody who never breaks his promise. Right. I will never leave you or forsake you. And I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit just so you know. Yeah. It's been mm -hmm. yeah. Here's another verse. It's First Peter 1, verse 5. And here's what it says. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power. Right? So, so, so you believe, right? You're in. There's the present day reality. But then it goes on to say, until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day. Yeah. So like you're in, but it's not done yet. There's more. You know what I'm saying? Like you're already in the family. It's almost like you're, you're in the college, but now you get to graduate or something, something like that. I can't put, to come. yeah, I can't put secular verbiage around it because it's a heavenly thing, but it, it, you can see in the text, it's, he's protecting you by his power. So you're in the family. There's your salvation. But it's also not going to be revealed till he comes, like at the end. Yeah. That's when you're going to get it. So that you can see the text definitely says that there's both. Yeah. It's and like I, this, this chapter that we're in that we call Life on Earth is, is a prequel to the goods. Uh, my daughter is six, and when she was four years old, uh, we were having a conversation with her. Someone had passed away, and um, 
And so she came to this conclusion all on her own. She said, so, so when you die, your eyes are actually open to Jesus. Yes, <laughs> you get it. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, uh, that what we're living towards is, is chapter one, really, of a billion times a billion times right. a billion. And, uh, but, but he's given us, um, he's, he's, he's blessed us with the ability to enjoy that now on earth. Here's an, another, this is, and, and you know anyone who's listening, I want to encourage you: don't, don't blaze through the scriptures quickly. Like stop and think about the exact words that are used. That's very, very important. Here's a, Romans chapter five, nine, ten, and eleven. It says, "And since we have been, this is what it said: since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, that's something that's already happened. So now we're in, right? That's past. He will." <laughs> certainly save us from God's condemnation. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's both. Verse 10, for since our friends, uh, since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Mm -hmm. So you see, exactly it's, what it's you both. Yeah. It happened and it's going to happen. Yeah. And so there's this present reality and then there's this future promise or hope that's absolutely going to happen. Mm -hmm. I want to share with you one of the verses that really helped me understand this. Okay, how do I, how do I experience the joy of the salvation when I don't feel, when I don't feel it? And it comes from 1 John 3 and um, starting with verse 16, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but in actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. Notice what he's saying. This is when your heart's troubled and you want to set it at rest, this is how you do it. When your heart is condemning you, you know, your heart condemns you when you either do what you know you're not supposed to do or you don't do what you're supposed to do, like he's saying here, you know, you're, you're loving with your mouth but not in, in deeds. He says this, For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Yes. We can be confident. We can enjoy. Yeah. He's, he's greater than our failures. He's greater than our doubts and our, our concerns and yes. our stress. Yes. Yeah. And I thank him for that every day. <laughs> um, I think it's important, and uh, as we close today, um, I, I sur found myself surrounded with uh, many people from many different beliefs. And... Um, I think it's important to note that uh, Muhammad died at the age 62. Uh, Buddha died at the age of 80. Moses, 120. Uh, you, yeah, Moses, I but, feel it. Uh, <laughs> Confucius, 72. Um, death was the end of their story. Death wasn't the end of Christ's story. He defeated death now in the grave rose three days later, mm -hmm. but everyone that trusts in him might have salvation, mm -hmm. access to the Father, will have salvation. Yeah. And, and when we say we yes, say yes yeah. to that question, when do you believe? That's not the end of our story either. Right. And it's, it's good news. It is good news, and it's news that's available to every single person walking this planet. And news no is meant to be done. shared. Amen. So, amen. Well, we hope we've been able to do that. I hope we're still not three pastors who think we delivered a good message of clarity and they're going, what? But hopefully we're trusting you, Lord. <laughs> You'll work it all out for everyone's good. Yeah, we'll probably look your at glory. this and say, why did Moses put this online? <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Time.